Hello there, and thank you for watching. This is Scott Nerney, host of the Spotlight Series on the Rhode Island Wave. With me today is Don Angelo, the immediate past president of the Grand Lodge of Rhode Island, Order of Sons and Daughters of Italy and America, and a contributor to the Rhode Island Wave. And quite possibly the longest title intro I'll ever read. Congratulations on thank that. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Don, so you're, you're doing some work for the Rhode Island Wave. Yes. We appreciate that, but let's talk a little bit about your background. Okay. Where were you born originally? Okay. I was originally <laughs> born, originally, <laughs> in Providence, Rhode Island. Okay. I lived there until I was, I think, 27. Uh, when I got married, I met my wonderful wife, Debbie, and we got married and moved to uh, Providence for a year and a half in her mother's two-family house. We then moved to North Providence, Rhode Island for 10 years. And after that, we moved to Smithfield, Rhode Island for 30 years. And that's where we reside you kept right moving now. further north? We kept going further north. I, I always say a lot of people were going south. Yeah, yeah. And I said to my wife, let's go north if everybody's going south. And it was a good decision. It's a great town. We enjoy it. And um, we're happy. Great. And I understand that you are, how did you get some uh, start in writing? Where did that come from? Uh, it started when Bob Duva ran the Rhode Island Echo, and we became friends over time. He was, he was a wonderful guy, and one day he said to me, Don, would you do me a favor and write an article for me, for the magazine, for the paper? And I said, sure, what do you want me to write on? I think it was on Columbus. I wrote the article, sent it to him, he loved it, he put it in the paper, and then a couple of weeks later he called me back and said, Don, if you could do me a favor, and you don't have to do this, but if you don't mind, could you write a monthly article for me? And I said, sure. And I said to him, Bob, what do you want me to write about? And he said, I don't care. Write about whatever you want to write about and send it in to me, and we'll put it in the paper. And that's what started it. So it's got to be a good two years at least, maybe more, two and a half or so, where I've been writing a monthly article for The Wave. And I, and I have, as we talked earlier, I have no idea where all of a sudden I've become a writer. I, things just pop in my head sometimes, and I write about them. And, or I'll be talking to someone, and they'll be, bring up a subject, and I'll say, I'll, in the back of my head, I'll say, well, that would be a good article. And I go home, and it takes me about 10 minutes to write the article on the computer, and, and it's done. And um, for those who haven't seen the article I wrote in June... And shame on you if you haven't. It is, my son passed away 19 years ago. And for some unknown reason, I was just sitting there, and it, and it popped in my head, why don't I write an article about him so people can get to know who he was? and what type of person. He was a very good person. And I just sat down and out came the article. And it was fantastic. I've gotten such incredible response from it. Emails, text messages, phone calls. And people just loved it. They, they said, I didn't know your son, but now I do. Mm -hmm. It made me feel real good. And then one of the great things that happened, I, I don't do any of the artwork on any of the articles. That's Dina's job and your job. Um, Dina called me the night before. She said, I just read your article. It was fantastic, but I'm not putting it in the paper unless you send me some pictures from 2003. And I said, fine. And I, I found some and sent them over. And then you guys did a tremendous job putting it together and um, made me feel really good. Really did this whole article and the response. has really made me feel good in my family. It's important to let people know what was and you know, the people we leave behind, the mark that they have on our lives. Exactly. Um, you know, and I, and I see when you go to a funeral that you'll see the big board up with all the pictures. And, exactly. And there's so many things that I see on so many of those boards. Like, I would have loved to know about that then and have a conversation with the person about that. Or, right. you know, I didn't know that. There's so much that you've lost that history to, yeah. to talk about now because the person's passed. Well, what happened in my son's case is I learned things about him after he passed away. Exactly. I had people come up to me and say, well, I don't know if you knew this, but your son used to do this for us. 
you know, whether it was shoveling an elderly person's walkway in a storm or helping them pull groceries in their house, different things like that, which I had no clue. Because he didn't, when he did things, he just did them. And he hmm. didn't say, hey, you know what I did today? No, he didn't do that. So I, I, I had a great feeling after also because I learned more about my son. And it was a good feeling. And really a was. lot of the people that read that article will have those memories again. That you exactly. Reminded them. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. He lives on. He did. And Absolutely. Absolutely. And what's the favorite type of writing that you like to, uh, to read you know, from a reader's perspective? Well, I'm not big on political stuff because as I've always said, when you read political or write political, 50% of the people are going to say, great article. 50% of the people are going to say, this is horrible. Mm -hmm. And when I read it, regardless of who writes it, I'll find something I don't agree with. And so I, I would rather read about stuff like that I write about. I, I try to write about people being good to each other, uh, trying to have a positive attitude, uh, doing things for people, that type of thing. Because I think that brings people closer together, makes them understand that we're only on this earth for a short period of time. And if we can do anything that makes it better for everybody, we should be doing that. But unfortunately, we don't. And how has that changed during COVID and as we come out of COVID, you're thinking about doing good things and, and people treating each other. It's It's been a whirlwind of two-sided on that as well. Yes. And I, I think there's a lot of horrible things about COVID. There are some incredible things that came yeah. out of it. Yeah. You know, some inventions, some different way of thinking, people yeah. helping each other. Um, but it really changes people's attitudes a lot. It's, it's absolutely true, but unfortunately a lot of negative stuff came out of COVID. Absolutely. People's attitudes, how they look at things, how they treat people. Mm. Like, the, a lot of places can't find help. You know, we'll go in a restaurant sometime and they'll say, you know, please be patient, we're short-handed. And I tell them, look, I'm retired. You can take as long as you want. I'm not in a hurry. But you get other people that are, will complain about that. You know, I'm waiting. I've been waiting 10 minutes. Oh, big deal. You've been waiting 10 minutes. Or you just get people that are miserable all the time because of COVID. My wife and I managed to get through it in a good frame of mind. Um, we looked at it and said, okay, this is something we have. If we're locked down for now, what can we do now to help us? And we would take rides. We'd take a ride down to the beach. Yep. We'd, we'd go through a drive through and get some food. We had a local restaurant, which I've been go we've been going to for 24 years, Shana's Kitchen. It's in Lincoln. And I talked to her, and she said, well, when they finally opened, I said, well, we're opened if you want to come in. I said, we're still uncomfortable. Mm. I said, well, if you want to stop by and just call it in, we'll bring it to the car. Well, in the winter, it could be 20 degrees. We'd pull up, we'd call in, and we'd talk to Courtney, one of the sisters and the owners. Say, Courtney, here's our order. She said, I'll be right out with your coffee, and then we'll bring your breakfast out when it's ready. And she would come outside and, and bring us coffee, and we'd sit in the car with the heater on. And, but at least that helped us kind of mentally yeah. adjust and accept what was going on. Right. We still were okay. We still had a decent time. We were able to see our kids. Um, and all was well when we finally got through it. But when I got through it, I saw different people's attitudes and it's just you have to have a you have to stay positive mm. you really do that's all that, that gets you through a lot of things uh, the negativity destroys a lot of things so my wife and I and my family we try to stay positive and get through things in a good way and at the Cuisin Inn there is no lines that's right the service is fantastic and fast Food is great. So come on out absolutely see, see us on a Tuesday in Thanks, fact, uh, after this, my wife and I have not dinner here. <laughs> fantastic, all right. <laughs> so that works out. And tell us a little bit about your career. My career? Um, well, I went to school. I actually quit twice, college, because I had clueless what I wanted to do. First, I wanted to be, believe it or not, a history teacher. Then I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. Uh, then I decided I wanted to be an architect. I ended up quitting twice. I went back because I knew I had to go back. I had to get an education in order to get a good job. 
I went back and took business administration and marketing. Um, I kind of fell into that. I was okay with it. I didn't like math. To this day, I don't like math. Uh, but the business administration and caught my interest in the marketing. So I got a degree in that. I ended up in the banking field for my entire career. I had a very unique type job. When people say banking, they go, oh, what was the mortgages like? What were the? I have no idea. My job, I ended up uh, working to set up automobile dealerships so they could get loans through our bank. So there were programs we would set up. So you went on the road, you stopped in, you introduced yourself, explained the program, and hopefully they would jump on board and say, well, oh, it's not costing me anything, so yeah, let's give it a shot. Over the years, I, you know, I was with Citizens for 23 years, we developed a lot of good customers, solid customers that treated us well, and we treated them well. And it was a fun time because what you had to do, like some customers would call you after a period of time and say, do you have time for lunch? Sure I do. I'll come down and have lunch with you. Oh, we'd have one. Do you like art? Yeah. Why? What do you want to do? What do you think? We can go to Boston. There's a, a, a show, an art show there with Monet's. Sure, let's do it. And, and then the next person would say, do you want to go to a baseball game? Another one, do you want to play golf? So you had to have this flexibility to adopt to whatever the customer wanted to do. But I would always have fun doing it. I had some wonderful customers over the years that lasted a long time. In fact, I still stay in touch with a number of them today. And uh, it made the job fun. Hmm. I used to say, I'd come home from work and I'd tell my wife, you know, I went to work today, but I don't feel like I worked, but I did. And we would get results. Our department always got results that the bank needed, uh, but it never felt like we were really working hard. It just was a natural progression, I guess. I don't know. I was lucky, very yeah. lucky. Yeah, because the banking industry itself is, and in just those 23 years, let alone since you left, it completely changed. Oh, it so has. The, the image it of has. You know, the credit union and, oh, hi, you know, Mrs. Nerney, or hi, Don, how are you, and everybody knowing. That changed. To, you're just a number, we hope you never actually come in. I mean, exactly. I, I have some banks where our money is I've never been into. Yeah. You know, and it, it's crazy how that side of the world has changed. Absolutely. But people still need to borrow and people still need to pay bills. So. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's why I thought I was fortunate because I was on the road 90% of the time. Mm. I would just call in the office, say, you know, today I'm going to be in Westerly or I'm going to be in Newport or whatever. And I was given the flexibility to do whatever I wanted any day. And it worked because, again, if I wasn't getting results, they would have yanked me in and said, you're sitting at the desk. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Now you know. Now I know. <laughs> now I know. And tell us about the Sons and Daughters of Italy. How did, uh, how did that come to be? That's interesting. I have a brother-in-law who passed away 10 years ago. And when we got first got married, the first couple of years, he didn't say anything. But after that, he started on <laughs> haunt me to death saying, you have to join. And I said, Ray, you know, I'm, right now I got work and I got some things going on. And then we had two boys. I said, not right now. I don't have time. Well, finally, about, I'm guessing, I don't even know when I actually joined, about 25 years ago, at least, I joined. And I took my time, got to know the organization, come to the realization that it was an important organization because we always raised money for charities and we gave out scholarships. So I said, this is pretty good. Sure. Eventually, I became a trustee with my lodge, the Piava Lodge in Providence, and then eventually they asked me to be a trustee for the State Lodge. Hey, yeah, okay, I did that. And, and next thing next thing I know, I'm president, and it's like, I always say to my wife, God knows why they want me to be president, but I had a pretty good run being president, tried to do the right things and what was best for the organization, and um, spent my time as president, um, and finished my term and moved on from there. I'm still on the board because I'm a past president, mm. but then I was president of the other organ another organization I belong to, the Verrazano Observance Day Committee. I became president of that organization. And that was good. That was fun too. You know, and uh, in fact tonight I have a meeting, Verrazano Committee, um, in North Providence. So how do you see the difference of the portrayal of Italian-Americans when you were a kid to today? 
Uh, well, when I was a kid, you know, believe it or not, I mean, uh, Italian Americans were called a lot of names. I know people that changed their name, so it didn't sound Italian. Um, good example is, and I, I guess I can say this, Jaswell Farm in Smithfield, fantastic. Apple Orchard Bakery, I go there all the time. Been going there since the kids were little. When the grandfather came here from Italy, the family name was Gesualdi. He came to the United States as a, as a well digger. He did water wells. Couldn't find any work. He decided maybe if I change my name to a more Anglo-Saxon type name or whatever, maybe I'll get work. And sure enough, he changed his name from Gesualdi to Jaswell with a J and he began getting jobs. So he left it like that. And then even when he bought the land, which became an apple orchard, he kept the name Jaswell. And so there was still some difficulties. My parents had difficulties a little bit with it. I, I was called names early on, uh, which I never liked. But I got through that, I worked through that, and it got better. And I think today, uh, People look at it a little differently, probably a little better. Hmm. There's not as much name calling today that I see as there was when I was younger. And people have come to accept, hey, you're Italian American, that's great. I always said that, you know, it doesn't really matter your ethnic background or your race or your religion, you're an American. So if you get up in the morning in a positive <laughs> view of the world, uh, which is difficult today, but act positively, try to do good things try to help your neighbor, everybody's happy, and there's no issue. But we can't seem to get to that point yet. Have you been back to Italy? I have never been to Italy. No? My wife has. I would like to go someday. She absolutely loved it. And we have a friend who just got back from Italy. She had to go to a wedding there. And she said, oh, Donald, she said, it's so great. She said, we ate pizza and pasta every day, and it was fantastic. The you know. pasta that was created by the Chinese. Yes, it was. <laughs> but the Italians knew how to <coughs> uh -huh. mix it around, so it tasted really good. Yeah. Well, Don, we have a little part that we try to tribute to James Lipton to finish our interviews. Mm -hmm. So I have some questions for you. Sure. What's your favorite word? My favorite word? Probably have more than one, but I love love. Okay. What sound or noise do you love? I like the 80s music, any of it, love it, absolutely love it. And would your wife say the same thing on yes. the radio? Yeah. And Good believe it or not, my 36-year-old son would say the same thing. He feels the 80s were the best decade for music. And I can tell you that's pretty much what's on my music in my car too. So absolutely. if we take a drive together, we'll be fantastic. I'd love it, love it. If you could do something with zero chance of failure, what would you do? I'd probably want to go to the moon or to Mars if there was a zero chance of zero failure. Chance. I would do that. My wife thinks I'm crazy, but I would. I've always loved, loved astronomy from when I was a little kid, and I always liked looking at the stars and the planets and doing things and you visiting the observatory and situate. And you want to wait till it's kind of like more of a day trip, though? Yeah, I think Elon Musk is working on okay. that. He said, yeah. we're going to get you there like in hours <laughs> instead of days or months. Um, what career would you least like to do? Would I least like to do? Probably a political career, because I'm not a politician. I always said to my wife, I would love to run for office, but I would only last one term. Because my idea would be, if I find something that's good for everybody, I would do it. Mm -hmm. Even if it was against the party that I was running as. Right. I would always want to do the right thing and the best thing for the overall society. So because I ca you wouldn't be able to do that, I wouldn't want to be it. That, that would be like, forget it. I don't want to do that. If you could go back in time and talk to your 12-year-old self, what would you tell him? I would tell him to please be more confident in yourself. Not to worry. Not to think, oh my God, I'm not as good as everybody else. Uh, that was always a problem with me, probably through high school. I always, for whatever reason, looked down on myself and thought I wasn't like everybody else, that I was, I just wasn't with it. 
and it made me nervous. It, it really did. And uh, if I could go back to 12 years old, I would tell myself, look, wake up, don't worry about it, be yourself, and things will just flow. Okay. That's what I would do. Thanks for being on the wave, and thanks for contributing to our paper on a monthly basis. It's my pleasure. I, I really, truly enjoy writing for the wave. I like the development of the wave, what's been happening. I'm thrilled that you're the new uh, interview person. Thanks. I think you do a great job. And, uh, it wasn't too brutal sitting on the other side? No, actually it wasn't. You made it, you know what, you made it calming and comfortable. So, no, it wasn't too brutal. No, not at all. I thought it might be when I saw <laughs> the questions you had, but no. no, it was a great interview. I enjoyed it. Right. And I'm looking forward to more of your interviews uh, so people can see on the wave on YouTube what's going on with uh, the world. And your wife is still smiling across the room, so that, must that's a good a, thing. You must have done a good job. Uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> she wouldn't be smiling. She'd be, you know, ready to choke me. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was Tom. my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you very much.